Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's CE. This is a race approved presentation, the multimodal approach to animal hospice. Our presenter today is Dr. Kathy Cooney. Dr. Cooney has been practicing advanced end of life care since 2006. She is the director of education for the Companion Animal Euthanasia Training Academy, Guardian Pet Aquaration and the Cooney Animal Hospital Consulting. Dr. Cooney is a past president of the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care and remains active in their organization, including the design of their animal euthanasia and has authored two books on the subject along with numerous articles and book chapters. Dr. Cooney is a strong advocate for best practices in all aspects of end of life care and speaks nationally and internationally on such topics. She is currently working towards board certification in animal welfare. We welcome Dr. Cooney. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm not sure how many people have joined on, but I know that you come from a variety of backgrounds and experiences. Many of you have very busy days that you are uh, popping in for this CE session, so very grateful for that and that we get to share an hour together talking about the multimodal approach to animal hospice. And uh, during the intro there, just to uh, give a quick clarification. So I am involved with the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care. And what I did help to design for them was their Animal Hospice Palliative Care Certification Program. And that is part of the credentials that you see there here on this title slide. It says CHP, uh, excuse me, CHPV, which stands for Certified Hospice and Palliative Care Veterinarian. And so if any of you are interested in acquiring more information and, and training in animal hospice, then the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care is the group to get familiar with. In fact, let's see, today is July, what is today, the 8th? <laughs> Something like that, yes, the 8th. And yes, the 8th. <laughs> thank you, the 8th, 8th of July today. And so in just a few days, the um, certification program will be opening up for the new cohort that will be for the class of 2020 to 21, just for those of you who are interested. And you can be a certified hospice and palliative care technician in case there are any technicians in the session today. And then CCFP stands for Certified Compassion Fatigue Professional. I thought I understood compassion fatigue until I took the certification course. Uh, that's about seven hours long and it was absolutely eye-opening. And I do hope that everyone that is interested in this field of animal hospice can learn as much as possible about compassion fatigue, not only to protect themselves, but to um, protect others that they work with and obviously grow in a personal and professional way. So those are my credentials right there. And yes, as mentioned, I'm working on becoming boarded in animal welfare and hope to bring my uh, that learning that I gained from the animal welfare training into animal hospice, euthanasia work, and just general end of life care. All right, well with that, let's dive in. So our agenda for this hour, we are going to work to define palliative care and hospice in general, but the focus of this talk will will really circle around palliative medicine because that is a big part of what we do in hospice care. And I wanna make sure that we fully understand that multimodal approach because it's more than just giving a medication and hoping that that's enough in this, uh, such a complex time with so many comorbidities as animals reach the end of their life. So we're gonna talk briefly about uh, vestibular disease and then talk about how we approach anxiety, pain, GI issues, dyspnea and incontinence. And all the way through, I think it's important that we also highlight the products that a CC has provided to this industry. I right now, as you're gonna see here in a moment with a little bit more bio, I am not practicing as much hospice as I used to. Instead, I've moved into more of a consulting role. I do a lot of writing and training, speaking. And so my ability to provide regular care for pets in my community has shifted. So I actually have other mobile services in my region that do that now, which I help to direct them in some of their case management protocols, but I'm not practicing as much as I used to. 
the one product that I do still have on my shelf is the Assisi Loop. And I absolutely adore it. And I'm thrilled to hear that Assisi is coming out with other products such as their Loop Lounge, this Clinica system, and then of course the Calmer Canine. So I am thrilled to be able to present with Assisi as a, as a sponsor partner here because I truly believe in these products as do my clients, as do my colleagues within this industry. So they are fabulous and we're gonna learn more about them as we go through this. So a little bit more about my background. I did start out as a mobile euthanasia provider in Northern Colorado. And within a couple of years, I started to explore the option of working with these patients well before the time of death, right? Well before these clients would reach out and say, it's time, I just can't watch them decline anymore. I'm too worried about how things are going. Uh, and the clients were needing more help. So I started to engage with them earlier, let them know that we could have quality of life conversations and I could do physical exams and then give them guidance. And it didn't necessarily have to be everything big and bold. It didn't have to be surgeries. It didn't have to be chemotherapy, um, you know, palliative radiation, those types of things that we could, if needed, go a little bit more uh, grassroots, a little simpler. And, and it really started to take off. Our clients were embracing that and saying, wow, if we could do more from terminal diagnosis to death, what a blessing, right? Because it sets the client up for success so they're not so worried, they're not so fearful of what's coming. You know, it helps them to acknowledge that death, of course, is a reality. It's, it's going to happen to their pet no matter what, but that we can reach or, or work along that journey of death a more uh, meaningful, right? And more enriching and more peaceful. So, so I really started to uh, hone my palliative care skills, learn more about palliative medicine. Again, I thought I knew everything, you know, starting up this service and then uh, was really quite awestruck by the amount of fabulous medicine that's out there to support these dying patients. And with that, then I grew beyond myself. So by the time I ended up selling my mobile service, which at this point was about four years ago, I had nine doctors on the team. We had a veterinary technician helping to manage cases. And I had uh, four support staff on the phones at that point because we were so busy. So if you are considering adding palliative medicine, hospice care to your service, I would highly encourage you to do so. And um, you can learn about uh, all of it, the best ways to approach it through the resources that I'll share at the end of our presentation. What you see here is a picture of me on the left. This is me um, out and about mobile work with my doctor bag behind the seat, ready to go. And then here on the right, this is actually my comfort center here in Colorado, where I'm working with one of my patients, Gunner there, that had mast cell uh, cancer. And so I have a little comfort center where people would come to me for palliative care. They would come to me for hospice consultations where we would design a care plan. And I also perform euthanasia in this space. And I have a pet crematory in Colorado. It's referred to as Aquamation. So I have a company called Guardian Pet Aquamation. And we receive deceased pets in this space as well. So when we talk about being a hospice care provider, most of the times what we're talking about is supporting through palliative medicine, it might even be natural death support, but euthanasia, bereavement support, and aftercare. So I do all of that. I just don't do as much of it as I used to, because again, I've shifted to more of a consulting and speaking training role. So palliative care and hospice really has a strong philosophy behind it, which is, we are going to do everything we can to manage our patients' physical and emotional needs throughout the dying journey. And we're gonna do what we can to support the client's emotional needs so that they are well suited to care for their pet and not again, approach this time in such a fearful and uh, uncertain way, right? It can be extremely crippling for these clients that have never walked this type of journey before, that may have um, done so with a human loved one that did not go well, for example, or maybe went wonderful, and now they're trying to embrace that for their pet as well. So this is still a very burgeoning, blossoming field of vet med, but it is, it's time has come, right? Our clients are, are certainly ready for it as long as they know that it's an option. 
So we're thinking about who are the bonded pairs, such as this, uh, these darling two right here. So we think about who, who everyone, who's going to be involved in this journey towards end of life and how can we manage that uh, for them? Okay, keep it enriching and rewarding for them. And uh, also that this type of care begins from the moment that we have a terminal diagnosis or where we recognize that age-related changes are advanced enough that death is coming, right? We do not have a set time frame for what that is compared to human hospice, which is about six months before we would anticipate that the human would die of natural causes. That is when they enter into hospice. That is when insurance will start to cover the cost of care. For animals, it's a little bit more subjective. So we might have a patient in hospice care for two weeks. They might be in hospice care for three days or they might be in hospice care for potentially six months or longer. I think the idea is to recognize that you can have hospice care, um, let, me, let me rephrase. You can have palliative care without hospice, but you cannot have hospice without palliative care. And what I mean by that is hospice implies that we know that death is coming, okay? So if we've got a patient who is just void of good palliative medicine, palliative support, they're not necessarily a hospice patient unless we believe that death is coming, okay? So hopefully that clarifies a bit of the difference between what would be construed as palliative care versus hospice, but there's certainly a blending of the two. So this illustration here, this uh, figure is going to reinforce that. So when we look at an animal hospice umbrella term or concept, these are the five subcategories that fall below. So palliation, AKA palliative medicine. We're also going to be supporting patients naturally in death, wherein our families do not want euthanasia under any circumstance. So we're really gonna have to reach for uh, our best medicine and our best client communication and education to help ensure that we reduce suffering at every turn, okay? Because we know natural death can be very complicated. Then of course, euthanasia will always remain a part of animal hospice. And then pet loss support is a, is a, is a mainstay right, a central tenant of hospice care, and then body care or aftercare, where we help the clients to make arrangements for how they're going to manage the uh, deceased pet's body, okay? So many of the times our clients are already well-versed on what they want for that, other times they don't know, and so we're gonna have to walk them through their options and help them to prepare. So again, animal hospice has five subcategories, all of which need to be addressed in some manner, and you don't necessarily have to be an expert in all of it to be a hospice provider, but then you would have to build a uh, you know, group of resources, others that you can call upon in your community that will provide the things that you may not yourself. But let's focus in on palliative medicine today. And I'd like to just ask you, what does it mean to palliate? So when you think about that, uh, if you really break down what this word is, it means to hide or to shield, okay? To make something go away, make it less obvious, to mitigate its severity. And ultimately what we're saying is that we're not making the, the cause of the symptom necessarily go away, the cause of the disease go away. We're just making it less obvious so that our patient can continue to live life as fully as possible, as comfortable as possible, throughout the entire end of life journey, or it could be of course well before the patient is even close to dying, uh, right? We can talk about post-surgery to, um, to anything from diabetes to um, osteoarthritis. That is all how we palliate. And we're not curing anything, we're just trying to keep uh, the patient comfortable. But this can also uh, be necessary and is very necessary all the way up until death so that we are mitigating, reducing the severity of those you know, active signs of dying that can be so uncomfortable, right? So we're thinking about uh, pain, we're thinking about um, issues with pressure sores or, or nutrition issues, uh, not being able to eat well, dehydration, 
um, sometimes seizures that can start it. And so all of these things we need to manage as our patient is dying. And the list is very long. I'm just kind of touching on some of those right now. So it's important to recognize that in human hospice, it's well known that providing palliative care to the dying helps them to live fuller for whatever time they have remaining on earth. And that is well documented. In fact, many people that go into hospice will come out of it because they're getting the right type of palliative care, right? The symptoms are so managed that now they are able to live longer and does it mean that they're not dying anymore? Not necessarily. It just means that they do not require the same amount of intensive care that hospice would typically provide. It becomes more of a great unknown of when death is going to come. Okay, so we are also seeing this in veterinary medicine. We just don't necessarily have the research behind it yet to prove just how beneficial palliative care can be, but it's coming and we would love to encourage you to get involved with that um, and get involved with organizations like I will uh, tell you about a little bit more later uh, to help to build more research in this area. It does work and it's worth harnessing the power of it every single day with our patients. So for the multimodal approach, this is an animal hospice care pyramid put together by Dr. Shea Cox. And you can find this in a variety of places on the internet right now, but it was initially published in the 2016 American Animal Hospital Association and International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care End of Life Care Guidelines. And this is a robust document that really lays out the foundation of care uh, for our patients. And I like this illustration because it shows us just how imperative these three uh, kind of tiers are, right? And I do think that physical belongs on the bottom because so much of what we do for our patients' well being is grounded in that physical support. So we're talking about pain management any management of clinical signs, whatever they might be, but the importance of maintaining good hygiene and uh, aligning with good nutrition, keeping our patients as mobile as possible, and then modifying their environment to keep them safe and protected, okay? That's very much an animal welfare mantra as well. Safety and good environment. So once we've got that foundation in place, then we also pay attention to our social well-being. All of these could be emotional well-being, social well-being, physical well-being. Engagement with family, right? We know that for the most part, our domesticated animals living in with the home with us, they are a part of our pack. We are their world. And so having an animal, for example, in another room who cannot get up and engage with the family in the, in the living room or who's gone outside, that can be very stressful for them. And that's going to affect their welfare. So engagement with other pets, making sure that they can do those normal activities that they love to do, and mental stimulation, right? Games, going to the park, um, you know, even eating can be a mental stimulation. And then more of the emotional component. What I love about here is the second one in particular, the will to live. A lot of us like to use the quality of life assessments, which try to make very objective um, ranking, if you will, of uh, pets' quality of life. And that is a really good tool for us to use with our clients of making a decision whether or not we need to bump up our palliative care or maybe reach for euthanasia. What I like about what it says here is the will to live is to make sure that we are including that in our, in our um, approach, right? That we are taking a look at, you know, whether or not our, our patient might not be as mobile as they used to be and they might not be eating quite as much as they used to be, but if you can still see a zest and an interest in life and engagement, then it might not be time yet for euthanasia. Anything that we can do to reduce stress is imperative for their emotional well-being. So let's go ahead and take a little bit deeper dive into physical care. Here are a lot of the things that we need to be considering when we're first even meeting a potential hospice patient, right? Getting a full history, getting as much information as we can from our physical exam to determine what is the likelihood of their current state of pain and what is the likelihood that's going to worsen, for example, next week 
two weeks from now, a month from now, right, based on their condition or a variety of their conditions, such as different comorbidities. Um, what's the likelihood of diarrhea, constipation, sores? You get the idea, okay? So as you're starting to formulate the plan in your head of how am I going to manage this patient, we really need to think about all of these different uh, logistics. Social well-being, again, engagement with the family. Are they able to do the things that they love to do? And how are we, gonna, how are we going to um, maintain that, ensure that it doesn't go away? Because when it does go away, it's one of the bigger triggers towards uh, euthanasia, okay? And then emotional well-being. I like this picture in particular because it shows a cat in a diaper. Some cats can handle diapers, many cannot. So it's going to be, is this, is this something that's going to cause them shame? Are they going to want to hide? Is this very undignified for them? And we can think about this with a variety of our patients, including uh, exotics, companion livestock, right? A lot of us are working with dogs and cats, but let's please keep in mind the emotional well-being of all of our different species that we work with. And with the idea of emotions, it's important to recognize that there are so many different emotions that our animals experience, right? There was a point in time where we did not think that animals had complex emotions as we do today. Okay, so this is very well shown and proven. And you look at this and the idea is to keep our patients in more of those positive emotional states and reduce down the negative ones as much as possible. If they are living in a constant negative state, then these are the type of patients that we would likely be advocating for euthanasia sooner than later, or you know, radically bumping up our palliative medicine approach to mitigate and reduce away those negative experiences. Okay, We do not want them living in a state of sadness or uh, annoyance, anger, um, you know, where they are where they are um, bored, pensive, those things. We need to try to move them more towards joy. And um, oh, what is one of my favorite ones here? I need to find it here on the slide. Joy, was, joy is always a good one. Um, acceptance, but there's another one that I'm missing here. Oh, there we go. On the periphery are some good ones there too, the love and optimism. But just really um, enjoying every single moment of the day as best we can. So we talk a lot, of course, about the five freedoms when we are discussing what is a necessary reason to move forward with euthanasia or to increase our palliative medicine approach. And I just wanted to revisit it quickly if you haven't seen it in a while and make sure that we understand that when we're talking about dying patients, they often have changed their need to take in food and sustenance, right? So while we might be worried that they are hungry because they are not eating, a lot of our patients do not want to eat anymore. And a lot of our patients do not want to drink anymore. I think what's imperative here is making sure that it is not pain related or that it's anxiety related where they do not want to go out to their food and water dish or it's not nausea driven and those things. So as long as we are managing those symptoms appropriately, if our patients are choosing not to eat and drink, ultimately that is a part of the dying process and we need to make sure our clients understand that as well as ourselves and our staff, right? That we don't have to be so panicked if our animal has not, if our patient has not eaten for a week, okay? We don't like it, but it doesn't necessarily immediately uh, lead us towards suffering, okay? Especially if they don't want to eat. So freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease. I think it's important to recognize that as animals are dying, disease processes are kicking in, okay? It is normal. What we don't want is for them to be painful during the process, living in regular discomfort, living with fear or distress, okay? That is unacceptable. And again, may move us towards stronger palliative medicine or reaching for euthanasia. The fourth one I just want to grab onto here, the freedom to express normal behavior. This is very, very important, but it, with the regards to dying, our animals have different behavior. So if you are not familiar yet with the natural death process, I encourage you to learn as much as you can about it. I realize that on my slides, I don't have that uh, where you would go to learn about that. 
in a very targeted strategic way on my resources. So I'll just tell you now, there is a great group called Bright Haven, okay, Bright Haven. And they've got a whole website and resource library of the natural death or the natural dying experience. And then there's another group called Spirits in Transition that is, re that is led by a veterinarian, uh, Spirits in Transition. And both of those will teach you about the normal behavior of dying and what to expect three months out from death, three weeks, three days, hours, and minutes, and so on. So the five freedoms, it's imperative that we have this at the forefront of our mind as we are approaching these cases. So the multimodal approach to physical care, we think about complementary therapies, alternative therapies. I'll give you some examples here in a bit. Uh, more traditional medications, diet or nutrition, physical therapies, hygiene, and household modifications. So environmental modifications, all of this plays into physical care. Then social well-being, now we're adding in, how are we going to practice enrichment time throughout the day? How are we going to help our patients to modify uh, those negative behaviors towards positive behaviors? How are we going to um, help them to engage with other pets that they want to um, and just enjoy the day through even some more playtime? So again, that social well-being and then emotional well-being to preserve the physical care and the social well-being maintain routine as much as you possibly can. And then I added in here something that I wish I had more time to talk about, but keep the caregivers, the clients, the pet parents, whatever you want to call them, keep them as stable and balanced and uh, with peace of mind as you can, because they are gonna have a more a positive energy around them that their, that their pets pick up on. I cannot tell you how often, in fact, you're already probably thinking at the top of your head that uh, yes, you have seen examples of when you, get your, when you get your clients more relaxed, breathing easier, more set up for success with their patients, that the patients do better, right? I even have, I'll just share with you this, this odd phenomenon where when clients call to make a euthanasia appointment with me, it is very common for them to say, the moment they made the decision to euthanize, their pet improved. Now, whether or not that is voodoo or some bizarre magic, I have to say that there's probably an energy shift in them that, that they have now made a decision, be it a very sad decision, it's still a decision that is maybe lightening their, their weight, their heavy heart a bit, and allowing them to breathe better and easier that now they've made a decision and perhaps their pet is picking up on that. So for whatever it's worth, I've seen that in action many, many times. So let's just take a look at this video here real quick. This is our least favorite condition in my world or one of them is vestibular disease. And I just want you to think, what are these uh, symptoms that this animal is going to be faced with that now needs to be managed, hopefully with a multimodal approach? Okay. So you are likely thinking anxiety and potentially pain. Pain can usually come from uh, being down, muscle cramping, uh, tension on already sore joints or spinal issues. Uh, it's not necessarily coming from the head itself or from the inner ear, but pain can certainly be present. We worry about nausea and vomiting. We can worry about diarrhea that is often brought on by the anxiety, and then eventually some constipation if they're having a hard time uh, you know, posturing or going to the bathroom. Sometimes we plug them up with anti-diarrheals and now they are constipated. They are certainly gonna have issues with mobility and hygiene. So the multimodal approach here is going to be reaching for those complementary therapies, which we're gonna dive into individually here briefly. Uh, more traditional medications, we're gonna to have to work on diet, physical, chain, physical therapies such as um, acupuncture if necessary, uh, laser therapy for deep inner ear, and even a CC loop, and environmental modifications to make sure that now this compromised patient is able to safely navigate in their environment. So again, physical care, social well-being, and emotional well-being. 
This picture has nothing to do with vestibular disease, but when we're faced with this type of case, what we're hoping for is sleep, rest, and peace, right? So that they're not so highly anxious, fearful of their environment, fearful of not being able to control their body and trying to allow them just time to rest as they heal. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into some of these issues. I did pop in here dyspnea and incontinence just because it's a, a, it's a big a trigger for euthanasia and a big struggle during our um, dying process. And so we wanna make sure that we know some ideas anyway, how to palliate these. All right, anxiety. I just love this picture. <laughs> and so anxiety, here are some ideas for us. So some of those complementary therapies, we might be talking about essential oils. Okay, a lot of good ones out there. And in fact, I haven't really spoken to yet the importance of reaching for alternative complementary therapies and hospice because a lot of animals don't necessarily want to take as many medications and or our families are not as interested in forcing them because it does affect the human animal bond. And uh, we want to make sure that they are uh, maintaining that bond and not, and not breaking it and causing more stress and anxiety than necessary. So some uh, ideas here, again, essential oils that are really good to reach for for uh, hospice patients. Uh, melatonin is fabulous. It's very benign, no side effects for it for the most part, and something that can be used multiple times throughout the day, if nothing else, at night. Uh, there are some examples of uh, composure chews, uh, neutral calm. One of my um, go-tos is Rescue Remedy. It's a flower essence, which a lot of you probably are already using in a variety of different um, scenarios. But flower essences uh, have been shown to calm animals and can be used in their, um, to ingest it, placed on the pads of their feet or even in the inside surface of the ears. I know a lot of emergency hospitals are using them uh, just to kind of take some of that edge off. But again, very benign. And if it doesn't work, that's okay. It's a multimodal approach. I would never suggest that for anxiety, we are using just one of these. It's usually let's use a variety of them in combination and in synergy. Uh, we start with the ones that we know are probably going to be the most effective and then we add in from there. Harp music, right here in the middle of this list, harp music has been scientifically proven to soothe. So I love harp music. It is one of my main go-tos for my hospice families. I will include it in my hospice kit so that they have it. And along with my Assisi loop, this is one of the number one tools that my clients say made the biggest difference to reduce anxiety in their pet. And you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, if heart music is proven to soothe animals, it's probably proven to soothe humans. And if humans are more relaxed, then ideally their pets are more relaxed. And now we've got an entire environmental uh, tool in use. And I think it's beautiful. So I do find a fair amount of my hospice clients uh, getting very anxious, even though we're doing a lot of education and a lot of communication, they're still worried, right? They don't know exactly what's going to happen. And so heart music can relax. Pheromone diffusers, we're very familiar with those. Those are wonderful to have in your hospital, to have in the home setting. There are different herbs out there and homeopathy you can reach for. And then in the home environment for environmental modification, please make sure to ensure that your patients have a space for sanctuary where they can uh, disengage, where they can go and sleep for long periods of time, where they can get away from other animals or activity in the household, where they can just get their peace and calmness. And then uh, opposite of that is their ability to engage more. Okay, so for anxiety, it might be making sure that they've got better mobility, where they've got uh, toe grips, where you've got carpet runners around. In fact, for years where I was doing my mobile work, you could always tell when you walked into the home of an old dog because there are carpet runners everywhere. And if there weren't, you better believe that's what I was getting in. That's going to be my, my job number one is to get them out there ordering up carpet runners everywhere for their dogs to um, navigate the house safely. Of course, we've got our medications, our pharmaceuticals, good examples there that we could reach for to uh, lessen anxiety. Physical modalities, often it's massage and connectedness, just relaxing those muscles can help. Um, just physical connection, because a lot of times our animals are disengaging 
And if they would prefer to engage and have that connection, just laying your hands on them can help to reduce that anxiety. So think about acupuncture, acupressure, compression wear, Reiki, if some of you have um, learned about Reiki or know of Reiki masters in your area that can do energy work. And then of course the calmer canine. So I myself have not started to use Calmer Canine, but it's only because I am not working with the hospice patients like I used to, but I am advocating for its use regularly because I really appreciate the science behind it and the proven effectiveness that it has. So I know that right now that it is being used in dogs. There is not a lot of research to my knowledge yet, and we can certainly address this at the end of its use in cats but I can see its applicability in the future and would love to know that that is a good you know, possible use for it. But in dogs, it has proven very, very effective through these, um, through these targeted pulse electromagnetic fields. And of course, manage those physical needs. So if our patient is nauseous, they're gonna be anxious. If they're painful, they're gonna be anxious. If they've got other GI issues, they're gonna be anxious. So make sure to manage those physical needs and that will greatly reduce overall anxiety. So pain, again, we have all of these different modalities to reach for. And let's take a look at Molly. She was the one you just saw in the picture there a moment ago. These are all of the things that Molly was on at one stage of her end of life journey. She was actually my own dog. She came to me at, 15, at 14 years of age. We got her through 15 and a half years of age before moving forward with euthanasia. And uh, again, at one point or another, she was on all of this. And again, I love the Assisi loop for her and I could target it at different places of her body depending on uh, the time of day. So for example, I know that Molly was tender in her hips so I could lay the Assisi loop in that area in the morning and then I could do an evening treatment somewhere else like in her front left shoulder in particular. Or um, in, in the case of more uh, painful areas, you could do double treatments in one spot in one day, um, same for another. Or you can reach for a bigger a device like the new Clinica system, the bigger pads or the loop lounge, where it's gonna penetrate more areas in the body versus that more targeted loop. But loop is what I had for Molly as this was many years ago. So all of these different things I reached for, again, all of them to address that multimodal approach for her. GI issues are one of our least favorite to palliate because so many times we don't know what's causing them. And we might never know because a lot of your clients do not want to continue on with blood work. They don't necessarily want to do x-rays. And when we know that death is coming, ultimately we don't necessarily have to because one of the central you know, focuses of hospice care is just to manage symptoms. And if we have the ability to do diagnostics, then that's just good medicine and we'll always advocate for it, but it's not necessarily always feasible. So we, we just have to reach for a minute, much of the time, we just have to reach for symptom management. So again, complementary therapies, there's a lot of homeopathy agents out there, different herbs and oils that we can gravitate towards that are going to have reduced side effects, medications, uh, typical things are usually going to be meropitant. That's good for, uh, for a variety of our species. What's nice about it too is it's got some pain management properties to it, um, but a lot of different things that we can reach for. Diet, obviously, and, and change in nutrition is going to make a big difference. And then some of those physical therapies like acupressure, acupuncture, that can be useful. Now, I just want to bring up that when it comes to any part of the body that has inflammation, that the uh, pulse electromagnetic field therapy can be of use and benefit. So if it's got itis behind it, there is some merit there to reach for ACC products. Dyspnea. I said GI issues is probably, uh, was certainly one of our least favorite things to manage just because there's so many great unknowns behind it. And it is a huge trigger for euthanasia. If we cannot get nausea and vomiting under control, if we can't get diarrhea under control, but dyspnea is one of the most painful things our patients can go through. And it's imperative that we get these under control quickly. 
Okay, and there's a variety of different ways that we can approach it. It's extremely rare that uh, for those of us who do a lot of palliative medicine that we will just grab one modality and say, okay, this is gonna manage everything we need for our dyspnea needs going forward. It just doesn't work that way. So instead, we're often reaching for these complementary alternative therapies. Essential oils is a great example. Uh, medications, there you've got your, your wide range of um, different options. Diet, you may be reaching for smaller meals, maybe more frequent because we know it's hard for them to eat and we might actually have to assist them. So if we've got an animal that needs to stay elevated, uh, maybe be in more of this opisthotonous pose where they've got their elbows out and their head and neck extended, obviously, you know, we, that's a pretty severe physical state, but we might need to assist them in their ability to eat. Environmental modifications, extremely important with dyspnea cases, and a rotating fan can help for those that might just be a little bit air hungry, but might not have uh, actual oxygenation issues. So in human hospice, just so you know, a rotating fan, movement of air around a hospice patient has been proven to be very uh, satisfying. It relaxes them. So if we're, if we're worried that anxiety is worsening because of dyspnea, which I can't imagine it wouldn't, a rotating fan is a very useful, simple tool. Uh, provide cool floors, cool environment in case they're hot. And uh, obviously hyperthermia is a big issue with, with dying patients, uh, those that have cancer. I put another environmental modification here, elevated food dish, anything that makes it easier for them to eat. Physical therapies, uh, home oxygen is definitely a necessity for many of these uh, patients. And I would encourage you to help them to rent oxygen delivery systems. Uh, you can have oxygen tanks or oxygen concentrators. Uh, you can help the family understand how to turn the body, okay, especially as a patient is getting closer to death, we need to turn the body. As we start to build fluid in one side of the chest, we need to relieve that, turn them over, propping them up, making it easier for them to breathe, as a lot of times it's hard for them to breathe when they're on their side. Uh, when we can help with coupaging, right, working the chest to get rid of some of that um, fluid and mucus that's been building up. And of course, a good uh, thoracocentesis, right, to alleviate some of the pressure uh, that's building up in the chest, uh, uh, eliminate that fluid and help them to breathe easier. So a lot of different things that we can do with dyspnea. It's all gonna depend on what's causing it and how bad it is. And with all of these things, it's really important that we let the family know that we can start with this, then we're gonna add in this and this and this, or we might need to start with many of them all at the, all at the beginning and and you know, hit them with everything we've got because if we don't, they're either going to struggle and suffer or we need to reach for euthanasia um, sooner. Incontinence, same things apply, all these different multimodal approaches. And this is a picture of one of my favorite little diapers, even though I can't really call it a diaper because it doesn't have an absorbent pad in it. It holds the pad within, it's called a pea keeper. PEE -E keeper, and it's just this, this uh, wonderful little um, outfit, and they come in a variety of sizes, but for a male or for a female, you can just put a sanitary pad in there, a maxi pad, and that will help to um, capture the urine or even feces that's coming out, um, but a, a nice, comfortable little outfit that doesn't make them too hot, very easy to use. So just in case you're not familiar with that one, it's a good one. So again, different um, homeopathies and herbs and oils we can reach for, uh, medicines, a variety that are out there. Uh, diet, we might be reaching for those that are lower in sodium, so we're not encouraging more drinking than necessary. Uh, we can reach for those that are rich in omegas to cut down on inflammation. And start with environmental modifications, those potty pads everywhere, and regular outdoor access as much as possible. So getting in those dog doors, putting in more litter boxes, whatever the species might need. And then physical therapies, acupuncture has been shown to make a big difference, even chiropractic. Um, you might, might be needing to reach for palliative surgery, which palliative surgery is applicable to all of these things we've been talking about. And then um, if we've got inflammation that's causing the incontinence, then again, we might be able to reach for some of these CC products that are so useful. 
just want to make sure that we touch on uh, what would really be included in a comfort kit. There's been a lot of, this is a hot topic, I'll just say that. There's been a lot of discussion about what kinds of things should we put in a comfort kit for a patient that is approaching end of life. And what I have found in general is that it's challenging because our patients come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. So one size does not fit all. But there are some pain medications out there that, that do apply or, or um, are useful for a variety of species. Same with anti-nausea support and anxiolytics. But I at least wanted to mention again, the harp music, uh, the ACC loop that can work for so many different species. And then uh, there are oils again, the flower essences and pheromone diffusers and a variety of other things that you might want to build into your comfort kit. Okay, something that is useful and reliable for all different patients. So just to circle back around here to that animal hospice care pyramid, this is what we're talking about to make sure that as we approach every single patient, and client that we're helping them to understand or to manage those physical, social, emotional well-being uh, parameters and that you can look upon uh, this particular end-of-life care guidelines as a great resource for you. And the International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care, they also have a 50-page animal hospice guideline that you can find on their website which is ihpc.org, okay? So you can start uh, relatively straightforward with these end-of-life care guidelines from AHA and the IHPC, or you can go with the bigger guidelines and some other books that I'll show you too. There you go, there they are. So we've mentioned the first organization. There is another organization listed second, the World Veterinary Palliative Medicine Organization, a relatively new group that more than likely will create a boarded specialty in palliative medicine, right? To be a boarded specialty, it has to be uh, fundamentally or primarily a veterinary organization. The International Association for Animal Hospice and Palliative Care is an inclusive organization for technicians, social workers, grief counselors, practice managers, and more. So, so this WVPMO will again eventually help us to be uh, with a specialty. You've got AHA also has got a senior pet uh, guideline, just so you know. And then here are three books that I find wonderful that are going to help you to understand better ways to uh, approach palliative cases, hospice cases. And all three of them are relatively new. The, the VCANA book is actually from 2011. And then both of these Wiley books, I believe, came out in 2017 or darn close. Mm, no, the, the last Wiley book, The Treatment and Care of Geriatric Patients, that might have been last year in 2019. Anyway, very recent and going to show even more so how this is a movement uh, that is really taking hold. And then we've got other organizations that you can continue to learn uh, good palliative medicine. So our takeaways, focus again, physical, social, emotional well-being. The more that you manage those physical symptoms, the more the animal can engage in social activities, and the more that will improve their emotional well being. That means that life is worth living, right? And just because, for example, we get uh, a patient diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma doesn't mean that it's an immediate death sentence right then and there. So that's what I love about learning more and more about the palliative approach are all of the different ways that we can mitigate those symptoms and maintain comfort, right? And what that does is not only provide more life, but it provides more time for the client to start to accept this new reality and mentally prepare for the end. And if you can um, you know, provide good pet loss support during this time, and lessen what's called anticipatory grief for the client, and then by the time the patient actually passes, our client should feel very good about what they were able to provide for their pet, and you also will have that takeaway as well, 
right? That you were able to manage the physical symptoms, that you didn't necessarily just reach for euthanasia immediately because you didn't know what else to do, that you harness the power of our best vet med out there right now, and that you were able to, um, again, provide life and good comfort and that you will want to do it again, right? That you want to provide more of this type of care and that your client is not so fearful the next time their pet starts to reach the end of life, right? And then the next pet and the next pet, and they might even be willing to go out and adopt a senior pet. And that's a huge, wonderful takeaway uh, from these type of experiences. So start with one um, approach to care or start with many. It really is gonna depend on your client. It's gonna depend on your patient. If you can reach for you know, five different things all at once because your patient can tolerate it and you know that that's going to be uh, you know, the biggest success factor right there, then do it. But if you can't, if your client says, well, I really just wanna start with something, then reach for what's gonna give the biggest impact. And, and for many of our patients, it's going to be a CC loop. Um, or a CC product, or it's going to need to be something stronger, like a like a pharmaceutical, okay, or or an anxiolytic. But we know that we've got a variety of products out there to reach for. Nothing wrong with starting with many if you can, especially if they can afford a variety of care. Move from Plan A to Plan B to Plan C with steady efficiency, because you'll find that uh, those quality of life charts, those uh, quality of life assessments. When we start to um, you know, worsen our patient's health, it's, it's uh, risky that if we don't move quickly into something else that we're going to reach for euthanasia. Again, nothing wrong with that. I'm a big advocate for reaching for euthanasia when we need to. That's why I teach and speak about euthanasia all the time and helping our clients with decision-making. But the idea here is that uh, your client is aware if plan A doesn't work, what plan B is going to be and what plan C is going to be and to stay in regular communication with them so that they're not falling through the cracks, right? That your patient is not falling through the gap and then before you know it, you've got you know, a train wreck on your hand that probably should have been euthanized maybe a month earlier, something like that. So big takeaways, make sure you already know what plan B and C will be, and note that in medical records so that not only you know, but your support staff and everybody knows as well. And support the complete patient as we touched on already, the pet and the client. So in traditional veterinary medicine, we look at our, as our, the pet patient as the, as the patient, but in hospice and end of life work, the client is of equal importance. Not to mention your team, right? Because your team has to, um, get fulfillment with this. And as it shows here, uh, you know, approach every case appropriately so that it is enriching and rewarding and meaningful and peaceful, right? So you, you're not building anxiety around the way that these cases are being managed. So learn everything that you possibly can. And then you will be more excited when these type of cases come your way that you know you've got the great opportunities to provide the best care you can. Preserve the bond, preserve that human-animal bond, so important. All right, so as we get ready to wrap up here, another big thank you to Assisi, and their website is there under this little cutie's picture, Assisi Animal Health, where you can learn more about the products that they provide. And again, it's one of my favorite tools. It's the only thing besides a heart music CD. I do have heart music CDs still always available, and I've got my loops ready to go. So with that, let's go ahead and open it up to a few questions as we round out our hour. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cooney. Wow, what a presentation. And for those of us who consistently have dogs, uh, so much new information, I was delighted to hear it myself. Great. So moving on to Q&A. Uh, 